everyone ready? Thank you for coming to talk with us today about connecting practices. Um, we're actually, since I know that everybody tweets during these things anyways, we have a Twitter back channel uh, going on DML Connect. Uh, so if you would like to participate, we have someone that's kind of moderating that space and there will be some people from outside of this room participating as well, so feel free to jump in there and share your ideas as well. Uh, my name is Anna Roberts. I'm the Director of Working Examples. Uh, I'm going to have each one of these people introduce themselves, uh, but instead of focusing on expertise, there's some really amazing research that says the more experts that are in the room, the less collaboration happens. <laughs> I am going to have each one of them tell you what they do, but then instead of their credentials, a little bit about a hidden talent they may have. So who wants to start? Eric, I think you should start because you said that you, you, had an you had an idea. <laughs> <laughs> I'm struggling. So uh, I'm Eric Klopfer. I'm a professor at MIT. I run the teacher education program in the Education Arcade. Uh, do research and development of educational games. Um, work with lots of teachers. Do teacher training as well. Um, I was originally going to say my, my hidden talent was system administration, which is my slide talent in my lab. But I thought for the purposes of this, uh, I'd say that my, my hidden talent so much is really more of a hobby is I keep a blog for my kids, which I think lots of people do. But I've been doing it for like uh, almost 11 years, um, once, at least once or twice a week. Uh, so I have about 700 posts and about 7,000 pictures posted on there. So I think that's gone beyond to somewhere around obsession. <laughs> <laughs> so that's that my hidden too. talent. <clears throat> Who wants Scott? Hello everyone, my name is Scott Trailer, and uh, I run a uh, interactive development studio here in Boston, or just outside of Boston, called 360 Kid, where we specialize in developing digital products, learning products for kids. We do a lot of app stuff now, or web games, Facebook games, whatever the request tends to be. Uh, I'm also pretty actively involved in the publishing world. Um, uh, up until recently, I was on the board of directors with the Association of Educational Publishers. Uh, now I'm on the executive committee of the Association of American Publishers. Um, and uh, so I see a lot of interesting things from publishing, but I'm always much more interested in digital disruption and what new opportunities could present itself for delivering content. But my hidden talent is um, I love all things spatial cognition. Um, I follow the research very closely and what's going on. And, psychometric testing with spatial cognition for the potential benefit longer term of STEM. Um, part of it started with interest in virtual worlds, but since then I find that it actually overlaps really nicely with the 3D maker movement. Um, so that's my little side hobby, if you will. Awesome. Who wants? I don't have anything that cool. <laughs> um, it's very nerdy. It is. It's very but nerdy. Nerdy is cool now. It is. You, you got a few more years. <laughs> I'm Connie Yowell. I'm the director of education at the MacArthur Foundation. Uh, and I have uh, two sons, 12 and 14, and in all my spare time, I am a chauffeur. Uh, literally. In, in addition to that, my um, hidden talent, I guess, I've uh, spent an enormous amount of my time, I'm a sports fanatic. So I spend an enormous amount of my time playing sports and mostly on the tennis court. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, my name is Michelle King. I teach eighth grade at the Environmental Charter School, which essentially makes me a professional hostage, um, <laughs> you know, middle school. Um, I came from a traditional public school, and then last year I came to the charter school to try to push the discussion on education. And um, I'm really an instigator. Uh, agitator. I'm trying to bring uh, learning back as a sexy thing. Learning is sexy. Uh, I'm probably pro-learning and anti-education um, and really trying to awaken the spirit in young people and all the amazing things that could be uh, done. I'm really interested in cognitive behavioral sciences, uh, Daniel Rayleigh, how, you know, how do people actually make decisions and choices and how do we really come to understand things. So we had a little back discussion about uh, thunder storms. Uh, thunder sleet and lightning and thunder during snowstorms, <clears throat> and we all deduce that to being uh, started by zombies. So clearly a or strong, vampires. or vampires. <laughs> vampires. So a strong STEM background in this panel. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> 
Uh, and my hidden talent is actually connecting people. I have for a very long time always been really excited about getting interesting groups of people together uh, who don't know each other and just being like, you guys should talk to each other. And I have these big birthday parties every year that are more about getting my friends to talk to each other that don't know each other than it is about celebrating my own birthday. So, um, so yes. My goal today is to talk about kind of big picture what connecting practices should be about. But then also, I think talking about theory is nice, but talking about how that actually applies to our work and how we can take things home is really important. So we're going to talk a little bit about what happens in the real world and then talk about some technologies that maybe people can use uh, to connect with each other. So does one of you want to start with our, my first question is, um, what does connecting practices mean to you? I, I think it can mean a lot of different things to a lot of different people, depending on what perspective you're coming from, and why do you think that's important? Anybody really that jump out at anyone? He's uh, I'll jump in. <laughs> yeah. I'll give it a try. I'll kick it off. Um, it's funny. I, um, you know, uh, some of the work that all of us are involved in. And related to learning, it seems like there's so much more that gets added to the conversation and, and new opportunities for learning or, or new opportunities for innovative product development when you bring people in who are experts in other domains. Um, um, I, I, find, uh, I find it very challenging that I'll go to an education event and it's a lot of the same people talking about the same things and I'm looking for the new ideas, I'm looking for the disruption, I'm looking for the breakthrough, breakout product idea that I find doesn't happen unless you get a lot of different people together to talk about what some of the issues are, challenges, problems. Um, so I, I, I don't know if this quite exactly answers the, you know, the, the question that you're posing. You but answer however you'd like. Oh, then yes, that's my answer. <laughs> <laughs> There's no right answers here. Um, I, I would say three quick things uh, about connecting practices that I, that I think are important. Um, one is that we're all uh, interacting with and dealing with the same kids and that our 19th century and 20th century uh, notions of how to put institutions together have put them in incredibly fragmented silos and so kids worlds are incredibly fragmented and we often leave it up to the kid I mean, in some cases the very engaged parent to then make connections across those experiences. And so if our practices are not connected, then that means a kid's world is not connected, even though we each have a little piece of that same kid. And so we end up creating horribly fragmented lives and experiences for kids that simply don't make sense. And so that's one of the things that I, that I would put on the table. The second is that I think what we've learned from, uh, and this is piggybacking off of what Scott said, what we've learned about innovation is so often uh, innovation uh, the research tells us doesn't come from within the group or within the community that actually needs the innovation. It often comes from a community that is adjacent to that community. And so when we can connect practices, we actually create the opportunity for innovation to happen because we are so often heads down and deeply into our own way of framing and seeing our world that it often requires sort of the community next to us who has can speak a little bit of our same language but comes at our problems from a very different perspective to wake us up, open us up to a new way of thinking. And only in connecting practices and communities can that innovation actually happen. The third is I would say that in the 21st century we live in a world of really complicated problems and those problems are system problems. And it is only, they're no longer within a particular discipline and so we actually have to connect practices in order to solve the complicated problems of the 21st century. The first thing I'm going to say actually is there's seats in the front here. <laughs> <laughs> <coughs> so you can connect to us by getting off the floor and on, onto the seats here if you'd like. Um, uh, I'll, I'll add a couple things here. So one is that um, I, I see connections as, um, as bi-directional and I think that's really important that um, information doesn't just flow from one community or one individual to another, but, um, uh, but it has to really be bi-directional and be collaborative in order to be effective. Um, the second thing, again, building on, on uh, I think what both now Scott and Connie have said in terms of innovation coming sometimes from the outside, 
I think it's I think they kind of use the word adjacent, which I think is a good word, um, because if it comes from adjacent, adjacent is good. Down the street sometimes is not so good. Adjacent, uh, down the street is too far away. Um, I think it's important when you're connecting these practices that you do have a connection to them. Um, I think in the in the space of education, a lot of people think that they have solutions to to all the ills of education, but don't don't know enough from being immersed within the system. They're too far away from it to really understand. How those, what the constraints on the system are, and how it works. Even if the idea is really good, the um, the constraints around this problem are are uh, are, are well known um, to be if you're within that community or adjacent to that community, but not if you're too far away. So, those are my two things. Um, I would jump on that. I, I mean, if you think of learning as an ecology and uh, people's lives, what kind of different systems do they participate in? Um, it makes you think differently. And so, think about you know uh, achievement gaps. It's really when you look at that, it's a kind of a scarcity mentality. What do I have to do to fill in that? But if we were to look at it more holistically, if we look at children more holistically in their lives, there's tons of resources. There's an abundance of resources that we can connect them to. And that one of the big things is being disconnected. So how do we connect young people to the communities? How do we understand them in the context of their communities? So I think shifting that way we think about uh, problems. Um, and so as a teacher, to be connected to a university and see what's happening, to be connected to the communities that I serve of the children, because there's a truth there, right? There's a local, hyper-local truth about what's happening, and to really understand um, the whole child in their environment. Um, I think uh, it's a critical part about being a connected learner. That all reminds me, too, of whoever was here for the keynote this morning, Luis Gomez, talked about the Swiffer uh, and kind of that sense of um, bringing in outside perspectives like a designer to help you solve a problem can really give you new perspective not only on what you're trying to do but how you are going about doing it and then helping you to connect also with your user in a meaningful way which I think is really important. Um, so building off of that what do you guys think some of the impacts uh, to connections? I mean I, I think connecting is hard there's jargon and and um, you know, just finding the right people to connect with and lots of different things that get in the way. So thinking about what incentives we need, what are some of the big impacts that can come from us connecting with each other? I think a couple, a couple things come to mind. Um, I, mean, I, I think we can make things that we can't make by ourselves. Um, and, uh, and we can solve real problems. Um, so, uh, oftentimes when we think about design processes, um, we think about, okay, here's, here's the things that we want to do, here's the things that we want to make, but in fact, we can't make that ourselves, and we need lots of other people to help us make that thing. So if it's a, uh, we do educational games, so in order to do that, we need people who are thinking about the content, and who are thinking about the, the needs of the teachers, and who are thinking about the um, distribution and the, um, the underlying system. So there's so many different ways that, so in order to, that for that to be effective that we need to think about how we can work together. But I also think solving real problems is really important. Um, again, this kind of goes back to the, to the adjacency that we, that, we, that we think about these systems from. So if, um, if I'm trying to um, solve the problem for schools uh, or the problem for learners, I sort of need to make sure that uh, if, if I'm not a school or I'm not in a school, uh, I need to make sure that I'm working with people who are, and that not that I'm handing a solution from afar, but actually really working from the bottom up together um, to, to work on those solutions. Because um, uh, it's too easy. It's too easy to sort of hand things hand things down from the mountain, and um, and they just crash on the ground. Absolutely. Any other important impacts? Um, I think as a teacher, it begins. You begin to see your what is your role in the classroom is different. If you're co-creating, um, if there are more things to learn, um, I think it it also makes you think about what's important to learn, right? I mean, we have kind of these you know fixed bits of knowledge that we think everybody should have, and, and yet there's some you know if you're dealing with complex problems. You know, there's issues that a community is solving that I think you could, you know, one of my colleagues here, Teresa the Flitch, that uh, campus has a classroom. The city is a classroom. You know, to rethink really about where we learn and spaces we learn and partnerships that we, we make uh, across our city, it makes us think differently about the city we live in or places that we live in, and therefore it really grounds learning in. We don't make, have to make a case all the time about why we're, what we're learning in class is significant. 
I, I think there are, um, you know, the communities of practice that we may limit ourselves to professionally, you know, unintentionally. And because we spend so much time within, you know, that group, we become unaware of the questions that we can ask. We don't even know the things that we need to know outside of our own little incubated group. And um, I, I think in particular, um, you know, related to what Eric was saying with learning games, and, and you may be familiar with this paper as well, that um, I remember I had this ha -ha mo uh, aha moment of multidisciplinary teams when I was reading this paper by uh, Carrie Heater and Brian Wynn at Michigan State, talking about what they discovered about making effective learning games. And I know this is you know, one lens to look through, and there are many others besides learning games to look through. But they said, well, OK, what happens if we bring a curriculum expert and a pedagogy expert and a software developer together, and we all try to develop that wonderful learning product that we so are eagerly uh, to find? And kind of th this one paper that had talked about the battles of a fiefdom, if you will, about what pedagogy said it has to be this way, and what software would say, like, well, no, that doesn't really translate into software. And, the content experts saying, no, I know best. And, and the big takeaway I got was that, you know, trying to bring these different groups together, some of them will try to lead or have the head seat at the table, where the important uh, thing to take away from this is that everybody has a seat at the table, an equal seat at the table, and we need to work and listen to and, and debate and argue with one another in an even-handed way to find that awesome outcome that we all so eagerly uh, desire. I think a really important, I, I, that was actually a really great paper, so if you guys haven't read it, I'll find it and we'll post it on our blog or something for folks. Um, but finding a shared goal is really important when you're working on connecting practices. It helps people let go of what their personal goals are and you, it's a place to kind of refocus people back into what it is that you're collectively trying to do and gives you an opportunity to think about how to communicate with each other in better ways and but having that space that you can really like we're trying to make a learning game for kids uh, gets you back to to that space did you have anything you wanted to add you don't have to no I'm good but I just <laughs> want to say um, I'm reading the tweets and so if folks want to make comments or ask questions or participate either just by speaking out or, or adding or paying attention yeah this is interactive so feel free to raise your hand and jump into the conversation in. to this isn't sage on the stage so you just talked about disruptive you talked about silos i'm interested in how you put those two together to break down the silos in a disruptive way to get some real good connected learning going on and good connections happening and what your thoughts are about how you get the players to the table to really do that My experience is you have to be really intentional about it. Like you have to, somebody needs to go into it with the intent of bringing all the players to the table and to continue, um, to continue to kind of fight the battles that need to be fought to getting people to talk to each other. And so at, around both being innovative and being willing to talk to each other, because I think that both of those things are very risky and it's challenging. So um, go ahead. I'll add two two things. So one is. Um, uh, so you're talking about shared goals. I think starting with a problem um, as opposed to a solution yeah. is, a way to, is a way to be productive. Yeah. Um, and um, But also having your cards on the table, too. So I mean, sometimes if I'm doing something and, and you know, if I make learning games and someone says, the problem is that you know, um, people don't know how to tie their shoes, um, and I say, well, maybe, maybe learning games aren't really the solution to that, then I'm not... I'm not going to be a part of that conversation, right. um, and so it's a matter of sort of saying this is this is what I have to offer here. This is how, how I can bring that. The second thing is um, uh, not everybody's a great collaborator, <laughs> um, so even the the best person, the who's the, the world's expert on shoe tying, may not be the person to bring to the table for that conversation because maybe that person doesn't play well in teams, um, and it's certainly there's learned skills and there's things that we can do to make people work better in teams. But some people are really good at doing that. Maybe they're the second or the third or the fourth world's expert in shoe tying. Um, and that's the person to bring in because they're going to work better in teams. Um, and so I think that's, that's really critical. I think it's important to be aware that silos exist and that we may have created our own constructs that lock us in instead of free us. 
Um, I, I remember a conversation I was very fortunate to have with Vince Cerf, the uh, internet evangelist for Google, and, and one many people argue the real inventor of the internet, and DARPAnet. Um, and I, I was having a conversation with him about search and educational materials and what does Google think about that? And, and he kind of responded, he said, like, the problem is, is everybody thinks that the way you find what you need is, ah, I have a math problem, so I better search for math. <laughs> or I have a science problem, I better search for science. And he's like, knowledge is fluid. You know, we as, a, you know, as human beings, we define these categories that actually prevent us sometimes from finding all the other helpful information we need. And so I, I keep that, I think about it often, it's like, what silos are we unintentionally creating that are preventing us from finding a solution? I would say first that it's really, really hard. Um, it's really, really hard. In that it takes a certain set of constraints and a particular kind of environment. Uh, so I would, one of the things that I've read that has been most enlightening and helpful for me is a book called The Only Sustainable Edge by John Seeley Brown and John Hagel. And part of what they talk about in, in building networks, uh, and, and, they talk, and they've done a ton of studies uh, of businesses building open and closed networks, is how incredibly important it is to build trust uh, amongst those involved in the network who are trying to solve or produce, either solve a shared problem or produce a shared product. Um, the other thing that they talk about is how important, once you have and begin to build and continue to maintain mutual trust, how important it is to be able to engage in what they call productive friction. And so if you can't if the folks in the network can't actually engage in disagreement and don't understand that disagreement as actually productive and part of the innovation process, then you've probably lost from the beginning. But you can only engage in tensions and friction if you trust each other enough to actually go down that road. And that any time you're building a network, there actually has to be a very skilled orchestrator who is managing that network and managing the people along that network. And we so often, we talk about community managers, we talked about product managers and business, but we often really forget, particularly in nonprofits, because we don't have enough money or for a whole variety of reasons, how incredibly important, and, and I've begun to see this almost as a role within philanthropy of program officers, of how incredibly important it is as you're building the network that somebody has to manage the relationships, the trust building, and be the person who in some ways uh, it is a, uh, a, a well-functioning network that builds, in our case, connected learning experiences, is a network that is built on peer-to-peer uh, -peer accountability so that, so that each individual or each group is holding the other group accountable. But it is the person who is orchestrating that network and helping to manage the flow of information and the flow of relationships that is also subtly managing the holding of account of holding each other accountable. And I think we uh, as a society haven't quite figured out that that's actually a job and that that these networks aren't actually going to function unless we value that position and that role in addition to valuing how we build the support structures to maintain the networks. Yeah. I I, I think the trust and respect piece of it is so important. I mean, when we, I, we took a very multidisciplinary approach to building our website, and it was amazing to watch people get stuck on, like, the word development. We had four different definitions for the word development, and people thought we're just communicating past each other, and it was very frustrating. And it took somebody being willing to sit down and be like, okay, so when I say development, I mean this. And those are the moments that you have to have constantly to get people to keep moving and keep having productive conversations so that you can kind of break down those roadblocks between folks. Okay, so what does a successful multidisciplinary collaboration look like in your minds? And can you maybe give an example of how that has or hasn't worked? I know Eric has a really awesome one. I do. <laughs> you wrote a book about it. You wrote a book about it. Oh, sure. <laughs> <laughs> Where did they forget? I wrote, I wrote an example of a mixed, mixed success one. But yeah, but I, there's, there are definite wonderful lessons to be learned from it. Sure. So um, 
So I, we worked on a project um, with NBC News several years ago called IQ. Um, and uh, uh, it was a, an idea that a colleague of mine came up with uh, and then pitched it to a bunch of news agencies to try to think about ways that you could engage kids with the news um, and news archives um, for learning. Uh, and um, it was a project where, um, in, in this case, I think a lot of the failures came from um, having great ideas that were not, um, didn't resonate with the reality of what goes on in schools. Um, so uh, the website was built, it was a really great website, um, the design was nice, the features were nice, but it wasn't really what, um, what teachers needed. <laughs> Um, and in fact, it, it was something that was really supposed to be transformative for student learning and have students really be the ones who participate with, with primary uh, source materials and do sort of creative and expressive things with these materials. Um, and in fact, teachers weren't really ready for students to be doing that in a lot of cases, certainly, certainly without sort of um, transformative training of their own. So what it came but it came to was being something that teachers delivered stuff to kids with. Um, so it was using the video archives, um, which is what the site became now. Um, and I, I think that really came from something where the, um, the, the, the line of communication between the, the end consumers for the product and the developers of the product were not on the same page with each other. And in fact, in a lot of ways, it was, um, in, in some ways it was designed collaboratively, but could have even been done more so um, with making sure that the not only the design, but the whole philosophy for the project from the from the from the funder's source, the the news, uh, NBC News, was was well aligned, and it really wasn't. Um, and I think that's that's happened in a lot of cases where people have great ideas, but don't necessarily incorporate um, uh, teacher communities from the onset of those, um, and and student communities for that part, because uh, in a lot of ways the students. Um, uh, didn't feel like they could become part of a community that teachers were also part of um, when this was at the sort of the dawn of the social network age uh, and um, and now maybe there's 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 different tensions around that student teacher interaction within those spaces but it was even then that, that that tension so once that space was colonized by teachers it was something that students didn't want to have any part of so I really think that sort of um, making sure that uh, even in, in, the, in the face of good design that it's really in the terms of a, a, a product that uh, all the potential players are, are really well involved in that and feel invested in it and feel like their voices are, are represented. Um, it's, it's, a, it's, not, it's, a, it's a difficult road to success. I, I have a question about that, Eric, because yeah. I find it interesting, you know, when you say NBC, the first thing that doesn't come to mind is educational product. Yeah. <laughs> and so right away that tells you, oh, there are some different teams here that are coming together to try to work together. And even without the contributions from the teacher community or, or from students, there were his own challenges right then and there alone. Yeah, certainly, right? certainly within that organization there was a lot of culture that needed to change that was, um, that was t challenging to change. They did not necessarily have the um, expertise to, uh, to, 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 to create a product like this. They had people who were former editors and um, uh, you know, uh, news folks who were trying to do metadata tagging of, of news archives that could then be useful to teachers. And so there was a lot of mismatch of skills within that set that needed to really transform that organization. And I think there's a lot of other organizations that are thinking about ways that they can transform um, uh, and potentially see education as a way, you know, from a, from a business perspective, there's people see education as a place where there's a lot of money locked up right now and that they can just get some sliver of that if they figure out how to crack it. Mm -hmm. um, but there's a whole lot of knowledge that's within the, and, and, uh, within the space of schools and learning um, and how that money is currently being used and is tied up and it, what it goes for that um, unless you understand that system with players from the inside of it, it's very, very difficult to understand and to, to work through effectively. Um, I could speak of an example at, at the down in the ditch <laughs> in middle school um, is my colleague and I teach in a class called cultural literacy and it's a blend of social sciences and uh, uh, language arts and I'm the social science history person uh, this is our second year in the classroom together and we built a game called colonial thrive it's probably the eighth iteration of a game it started off last year uh, answering a question uh, Jared Diamond's theory Gunstrom still does geography determine your destiny uh, and then we added more variables to it um, and took five European nations and five Native American nations, and the goal was to thrive in the new world. 
Uh, we added some constraints like coexistence, uh, try to get, you know, um, nations to coexist with competing uh, value systems. Uh, we added uh, another mechanic in the game, which is, uh, or I should say constraint, which is uh, in order to win the game, uh, all nations had to be above the failure to thrive line. And uh, so we just played this out. We built the game with the kids from the ground up. It's a huge physical game. Um, and it worked because my colleague and I, even coming from different interests of language arts and history, uh, had the, the kind of agency and control to build that. We had autonomy to build that. So the part of some of these work is that the conditions have to be there. Um, there has to be a certain level of freedom. There has to be, I mean, we failed a lot. I mean, this game, which is great, is the product of multiple failures. And so unless the system values failure, you're not going to get people to be willing to take those kind of risks. Um, the kids understood from not just the playing of the game and understanding history, but also the mechanics of building a game. And we tested parts out, we built it, and so we all had a, a, a sense of control. Because you have to remember, children also come with their own curriculum and their own learning. And how do we kind of build this kind of learning community together? And I think capacity building is one thing that I've learned. Because you can say like, oh, let's do this together. But if we haven't had the practices of learning and having a sense of agency, that makes, makes it really difficult. Um, also, I would say there's some level of ego killing that one has to do. Um, having been a single teacher in a classroom to now work with another colleague and sometimes uh, having the wisdom to uh, let others take the role, even for kids to take that space and drive the learning and ask interesting questions. Um, so I think there, for those kind of collaborations, there are a lot of things that have to happen. You have to have somebody who's going to um, instigate and, and coalesce because building a building a movement or building collaboration takes a lot of work. You think about it, I like this quote by Jesse Schell. He says, the next war is the war for our attention. And we have limited bandwidth. So how can you get to people to see value, to coalesce around things? Um, and one way is autonomy, one way is um, being able to fail openly uh, and without shame, so. Yeah, and I'll give a different example. and. Um, Amy, you're here, and I don't know if there are other folks here from you, from the original U Media days. That, uh, hey, how you doing? <laughs> you walked in right on cue. Um, so in Chicago, <laughs> ouch. No, this is East. She's. It's a good story. It, so in Chicago, God, maybe six years ago. Um, Mary Dempsey, who was then the commissioner of the Chicago Public Libraries, uh, came to my, my boss, who's the vice president, Julie Stash, and said, I have this 5,000 square foot space on the first floor of the Chicago Public Library. I've always wanted a teen center. Can you do something with it? And we were in the throes of reimagining what public libraries could look like and really thinking about it. And so what, what we did as a foundation, because we have outreach and can bring in networks, we're able, we brought together um, Carnegie Mellon University and Jesse Schell, uh, and Nicole Pinkard, who is chairing today's uh, the conference, and the Digital Youth Network had been running an incredibly successful after school project in the south side of Chicago. And so I went to Nicole and said, I really want you to do your work in the public libraries. And she said, absolutely not. I work in after school programs. Why would I want to work in a library? Um, Katie Salen, who is a game designer. Uh, Diana Roten, who now is at Amplify, but helped start some of our, our Hive networks and had been at NSF. To say, we, the, here are the constraints. It's a 5,000 square foot space, and it's in a public library. And we're working with librarians. But we have been working really hard on what it means to engage young people. And particularly with digital media, what can we do with this space? A bunch of things about that collaboration. One is how incredibly important leadership is. So that Mary Dempsey was both a visionary in terms of being open to thinking about what the space could be and trusting in terms of letting her people, Amy and others, sort of have that autonomy to, to lead on it. Um, but secondly, that in addition to having agency, I also think there's the strategic listening so that when people come in and start bouncing ideas off of each other, so Jesse came in, 
um, looked around at the library, showed the librarians a whole bunch of different pictures of libraries, and said, books are really deadening. I don't think we should have books in this space. And the librarians being able to say, we're a library. <laughs> there are going to be books in this space. <laughs> and then going from there to say, but how are there going to be books in this space? And what would the space actually look like? They don't have to be in the traditional way that books are in the space, but maybe we can think about how we want to have books in the space. And for, the, and for Mary Dempsey to say, of course we're going to have games in this space, but the games have to be linked to our identity as a library. We're not just going to have any video games in the space. So Katie, how do you, tell us how we're going to have, let's work on what it means to have games in this space. And Katie really saying, okay, this is a library. The library has its own identity, its own resources, its own way of being. What does that mean to me as a game designer and how I want to work with them as a game designer and think about what their policies and what their approach to games ought to be. And so, and Nicole, who didn't want to be there at all, going in and before the space was even designed, implementing her program on a different floor so that she and her folks could really learn about the space, learn about what youth would do in that space, and not assuming that she knew exactly how to take her model and force it onto the space of the library, but to spend an enormous amount of time with Amy developing a relationship and then saying, okay, I've spent six months implementing what I know how to do in your space, and now we can co-design together. And so it was a, it, it was um, an incredible co-design process where people who could have been incredibly proprietary about, I'm a game designer, and this is what I do, and you can do it my way in your space, and people who could have said, this is my space. We're librarians, and this is our space, and we're only going to do it in a particular way, who instead all came together to say, tell me what you know, and I'm going to really think about what you know how to do, but I'm going to think about it in our context, and let's reshape that together. Um, and it has turned out to be, I think, uh, for the youth in Chicago, a mecca and a space that where kids only went because they had to for school that now draws kids from across the city every day in a way that it never did before. And it's because of the way the adults put down their egos and really trusted each other to listen to each other and figure out what that meant for, the, for that space. I like the story about food. Oh, the story about food. <laughs> Do you want to tell the story? So, um, I think it, Amy said to both Nicole and to some of the other DYN folks, there's, we don't eat in the library. There's no, there's no food in the library. And Nicole, who, does the after, who spends all of her time with kids, is like, okay, kids get out of school at two, you think they're going to come to this space and they're not going to eat? If kids don't eat in the library, kids don't come to the library. So you either have to figure out what you mean by and they're like, okay, well, maybe we can have a vending machine in the basement. And she's like, kids don't eat in this space, they don't come to this space. <laughs> kids eat. That's what they do. So Amy gets on her Blackberry and emails Mary because they're listening and they want things to work. And then, you know, the email comes back and she says, okay, kids will eat in this space. And so there's a part of the space where kids are eating and it's a normal space for kids. I think you really hit the nail on the head, though, because I'm convinced that food is the key to collaboration. <laughs> yeah, no, it absolutely is. Truly. It absolutely is. Uh, you know, the, related to that, I, I run, um, when, when I travel around and go to education conferences, I'm always impressed and amazed by the ability that librarians have to think about change, because yeah. they really, especially now, are really forced to think of differently about what their space is going to become. And I, I sometimes, and I've met a lot of school librarians as well, and I think the same thing, that I, sometimes I wonder if the gateway to change in a school is the school librarian, and not necessarily the administrator or the district leader, uh, but to go at the librarian, because they're so willing, he, she, to think about the possibilities of changing the space. Yeah. We have some quiet applause from the corner over here. <laughs> <laughs> um, Fantastic. Those were all really amazing examples. Thank you. Uh, so connection is important. What do you guys think in this space are some of the most important connections that are not being made? Um, I, th I think the kind of changes in education and parents and, uh, and politicians 
because I think people remember what school was like for them. Um, but they're so far removed from the classroom. You know, like you make a policy, but you don't have to live with the consequences of the policy. And so people think, oh, well, we'll add this test, and everybody thinks, oh, well, we'll just add tests, and that'll be an efficient way in which we figure out what kids know. And then you go, have you met a child? Um, because they don't like that. Um, <laughs> and that's, it's not interesting, it's not engaging. Um, so I, th I think we need to um, make connections even to parents. You know, what, is, what does it mean to learn now? You know, what is it when you can have the sum total of human intelligence, right, at, you know, access uh, to that? Um, what does it mean to deal with complexity? Like, life doesn't show up as a math problem. You know, we, we had the government <laughs> shut down for a couple of weeks, and it's not, it wasn't, you know, that was a complex problem. It's like, what's the role of government? Uh, um, you know, what are big states, small states, who gets to decide? I mean, there's so many things that are going on, and so in, I think we need to have those kind of collaborations with parents to really understand the kinds of learning and learning environments and really interesting problems we can tackle. Because I don't think we're having us the same discussion. There's kind of the economic argument of like, oh, I want my kid to get a job. You're like, were you reading anything? Um, but I think education is much more complex than that, and it's um, richer than that, right? We want people to be self-actualized. We want them to be empowered and connected to their communities. And if you ask parents that, what, what are your wishes for your child? They don't necessarily talk about, you know, having all this money and these jobs. They, they want to live a fruitful, loving uh, life. And so how can we all get onto the same page uh, and make the, and have those conversations? Because I think that's going to really help. Um, I think a lot of us don't know what we don't know. Parents don't even know, like, all the issues that are being faced in the classroom or different ways of learning. Invite them to hack jams. Invite them into the spaces to learn um, as well. Or hold learning in their communities, learning parties, uh, those kind of things. So, awesome. I think so. There's I, I alluded to this a little bit before, but there's sort of a new um, a new wave of interest in in educational technology, which is primarily coming from the technology side, um, and um, and I've heard this pitch a million times, and it goes something like this: <clears throat> They show a picture of a classroom from 1935. Yep. There's a bunch of kids sitting in desks. And they say, and here's a picture from today, and you see the same thing in some color. Um, and they say, and, and technology is the solution to this. We can give each kid their own um, educational solution by having them sit at a computer or an iPad or a smartphone or whatever it is, and it will deliver their t tailored, perfect instruction to that individual child. And they're all sitting in front of computers. And they're all sitting in front of computers. <laughs> <laughs> and that, and now, we've, now we've improved yeah. the system a lot. Yeah. Instead of having everybody sort of in a common, so that it's in this case, I mean, there's a lot of there's a lot of disconnects. There's the there's not an understanding about how learning works, which is a social process. It's not just an individual process. There's a, a problem in understanding how schools work. There's a, I mean, there's a, a lot of disconnects between um, a lot of good ideas that could potentially have a lot of valuable impact because there it is when you have a classroom of 35 or 40 kids, it is difficult to have instruction that that both challenges and suits everybody in the classroom. But the solution is not to necessarily divide everybody up into carols and sort of have them have their own tailored um, individual solution without relating to the other students in the class. So I think um, uh, I think there's a lot of potential for that. I don't want to say it's just time. We don't, we don't want to just jettison that, that those ideas because there's a lot of value and a lot of energy and a lot of um, uh, good technology in there, but it has to sort of mesh with um, what we know about how learning happens and about um, how, how learning communities happen. I, I think of that example of the photo from the 30s and one of today, often I go like, well, what has changed? Well, learning instruction, the curricular materials, the surfaces of a classroom, you know, all the many things that aren't captured in those photos. Because I feel that's a disservice to teachers to say nothing's changed because, you know, they're working really hard and there is a lot of change, but yet the perception is nothing has really changed. Um, I think, you know, you, you, you touch on an interesting point that I think um, is not fully realized by at least uh, maybe the venture community in ed tech is that tech for tech's sake does not make a better learning outcome. And um, I also follow the toy space and, and dabble and do work in the toy space. And one of the reasons why I do it is because they dabble with tech and they fail quickly. And they live and die by whatever they thought of yesterday and what sells today. And an interesting trend occurred to me this year after watching, you know, like a decade worth of, of really terrible, playful, wrong ideas with technology, is that toy companies started to get it right this year. 
it only took them forever, but there were many more products that were playful, that were engaging. And I asked myself, well, they finally woke up and figured it out. It's about the play. I wonder if the education community can do the same thing about ed tech, that it's not about the tech, it's about the learning and integrating it in a way that it's, it has an outcome that's not all about the tech, it's about the learning. I want to push on that for a second. And uh, there are lots of connects that aren't being made, but I think the one that is most brutal for kids is that um, the content is not relevant to the learner. And so one of, uh, uh, and I think that's because we have the wrong outcomes. And so that one of the things that I've learned from game designers, and sometimes when you have these adjacencies, you're in conversations with folks who think very differently from you. I'm an educator, background in education. And so uh, I was in a conversation with the game designer and I was asking her a question and she said, no, you gotta understand, content's just the context for participation. It's not the outcome. I was like, what'd you say? <laughs> and she said, yeah, no, when you're designing a game, the content's just the context for participating in the game. It's not the outcome. I was like, okay, that is a radical statement for an educator. Because in education, the content is the outcome. It's what we're testing all of our kids on in the standardized tests is, did you learn that outcome? All of our teachers spend all of their time focusing on getting kids to learn content because they're gonna be tested on that content. That content is not relevant to the kids. We have to shift the content in all of our pedagogy to just be in the context in which they're participating in solving complex problems that they care about. And they're learning the content along the way, but the content is not what they're focused on. It's solving the problem that they care so deeply about. That's in connected learning. That's why we make interests so important. So that the content is just context. And so that if we consistently make content the outcome, we lose the opportunity for relevance and we lose the opportunity to connect to kids. And so that's for, that for me was a major shift and one of the incredibly important things about working with folks that I don't usually work with and working with designers who actually have to design for users who have to be engaged. And I think that we as educators consistently, uh, because we are so focused on the wrong outcomes, because uh, those outcomes don't give us feedback on how well we've designed the learning experience for the user, uh, consistently miss how to make the learning environment better for our kids. And that's an incredible connection that we have got to work on. I think that's actually a really exciting example of one of my favorite things about connecting with different practices isn't necessarily some big, huge collaboration that has to be super structured and whatever, but it's these moments where you, where someone else's very different perspective completely shifts the way that you're thinking about the work that you're doing. And the, they can be small, mm -hmm. small things, but just having people around you that can continue to question the ideas and how you're thinking about things can really have huge impacts. There's someone with a hand up. Oh, so just one way of uh, speaking down. Um, there are, uh, I, I just recently wrote a blog about this for Kids Screen about, usually I, I'll, I'll pick three things out of, you know, dozens that I've seen. Um, apps and physical product often had a forced play pattern that was not engaging and the tech didn't work well and it was a dog and that's in the last three years that's the way a lot of toy companies build things. But this year I think they spent more time thinking about, well, what is the pretend value? One of the real big tech talks of Toy Fair was this product called Wikibear. And the way that the journalists at the show described it was, well, you know what Siri is on your phone? Well, imagine you have a stuffed animal in bed, going to bed, but it's Siri aware. You can talk to it and it will speak back to you in context to what you're asking for in the right tone. And it had some rough edges and everything. And it's, is this gonna be the thing that everybody buys? I'm not sure, the tech needs a little bit uh, uh, fine tuning, but would you pay 60 bucks for something like that? And you're like, whoa, the price point is not like 300 bucks or 120 bucks. It's like 
this, I'm constantly amazed, and when I go to these other shows to try to find inspiration, like we're living in these science fiction days. It's, things are happening. Like the tech is allowing for amazing kinds of powers of communication and engagement that we couldn't even envision just two years ago. So one of the big things was this teddy bear that will talk to you. And a lot of people joke, well, many adults need it as a therapist, and you can probably <laughs> wire it that way. And now I'm sure somebody's building that. And uh, there was another toy company that made a $30 version of uh, Google Glass, 30 bucks. And it worked better, <laughs> actually. It wasn't Wi-Fi connected, but you know the way that these things are made and the cost of components, you could make it Wi-Fi available for another five bucks. So a $35 kid-based Google Glass. It was, it was, this was some of the stuff that I saw in the robotics took a huge leap forward, which then gives me excitement about robotics in the classroom and different electronic kits. Um, I, I think it was a really noteworthy year in the play space, and that's why I think about, well, what could that mean in the learning space? Hopefully that wasn't too rambly, yeah. sorry. Scott, will you tell the story about the German toy makers? Uh, sure. Um, uh, I participated in an event in Chicago called uh, Chai Tag, which was um, uh, a woman named Mary Cousin, who is well known in the toy industry, had the brilliant idea of just creating an event for inventors. And uh, it's a brilliant idea, and it's a very popular uh, conference, uh, usually held in November in Chicago. And um, we were talking, uh, we had to get together one time, we were talking about what is she seeing, what's noteworthy in the industry. And she said, well, I just came back from the German toy fair, and I spent a lot of time there. And you know, different countries have their different times of toy fair. And she said, there was this most amazing meeting I went to. All of the German toy manufacturers who compete against one another all got together in a room, and they get together often to share their new products that they're going to roll out together collectively. And I said, that's crazy. You mean the competitors? Like, could you imagine? Uh, Disney consumer products sitting down with Mattel to show the newest fairy princess to one another? No, that would never happen. And I said, what's going on there? And they said, it's so important to the German toy community that Germany succeed in toys hmm. that they're willing to overlook the fact that they're competitors. And so they get together frequently and often to talk about what can we do to change the situation for our state of business in Germany. And I thought, could you imagine Pearson, McGraw-Hill, Scholastic, Houghton Mifflin, Harcourt <laughs> sitting down and sharing their new textbook and their new online MOOC and everything. And I go like, maybe that's actually what they need because they are kind of floundering at what is the next thing, what is their next move. <laughs> yeah, that's too bad. I mean, I thought it was a really fabulous story. I've been telling it to all yeah, kinds of I, other I industries. For, for Good or for evil, or sure. Like yeah. That. yeah. <laughs> Just to kind of build off that, uh, I come from the Denver Boulder corridor, and I have mm. entrepreneurs and startups too. So yeah. Yep. Together, yep. Even though the brand of industries, the competing markets, have mm -hmm. to get together because they know as a community, yes, they're going to make the entire region thrive if they work together. As a in particular, in Boulder too. Boulder's got stuff that's just dynamite right now in the startup space. Really great investment opportunities there. Um, I would say that's why I moved from a traditional public school to a charter school, was to push these conversations. Uh, we are not competitors. I'm, I'm not competing with a private school. I'm not competing with a public school. Um, because it's, it is in my best interest that somebody else's children in my community is, is, is thriving. And so if we look at the problem in that way, um, then we begin to solve the problems differently. If we look at it from scarcity, a scarcity mentality, i got to get mine for my own, we often take more than we need. We put others at a disadvantage, and it, we, saw, we, we just create you know, the same kind of problem. So if we think in this way, um, you know, ch the, the nature of charter schools are meant to push ideas out, to share ideas, to build community, um, as opposed to kind of thinking as teachers as just individual and, oh, okay, the private school has their thing or the public school has their thing. But in fact, we are a community of educators uh, trying to do what's best for our city. The, you know, the health of our city are tied to the well-being of our children. So. <laughs> There's something about being the underdog that sort of works, I think, to kind of get that yeah. community to rally together. Because mm -hmm. I can see, you know, in, cert in certain sectors, I can see that sort of even happening now. I mean, so there's in startup communities, it's, it's yeah. still like we're mm -hmm. there's a big space we're trying to work together to 
to, to make moves forward. I mean, I, I think, you know, I see this within children's media and sort of small games companies. We'll do s things at small scales like that. Like there's, there could, there's power to organize and do more, perhaps. Yeah. No, very true. I, just earlier today, we were talking about how Pittsburgh is becoming like this amazing hub for children's media. Mm -hmm. And when you share that with other people, they often go like, Pittsburgh? I say Pittsburgh's praises, trust me. I mean, the foundation work that's there, the commitment to the education community within Pittsburgh, public television. I mean, there are so many forces that have come together. I mean, even policy to some degree. Yeah. And I, I often say to other cities, there's something there that needs to be replicated. There's something magical going on in Pittsburgh right now that is hard to find in other areas of, of just, whether it's education or, or content development or anything. And, and there's a model worth looking at. Yeah. It gets back to my underdog. Yeah. Pittsburgh yeah. definitely yeah. Is an underdog. <laughs> well, we have a Kids and Creativity Network, and it's it's based on that premise that we're there mm -hmm. to, to succeed. Everybody, you know, I want the, you know, even if it's a competing institution, I want them to do well. They're doing, they're doing right. right by other children. We and actually so, um, have a bunch of them in the room right yes, now. Yes, we have a lot of... So. Yay. Um, and yeah. I well, was, and their success is your success. Absolutely. You want them to succeed. Yeah. Absolutely. And I, I, came to, I, I came to them a couple years ago through Greg Bear at the Grable Foundation, and I was talking about learning ecology and excited about learning. He's like, hold on a second, sister. <laughs> <laughs> and he brings out this map of all these organizations in Pittsburgh, and I was like, how, how do I... How do I not know that? And you know, just the real fervor and excitement, you get to see your, your city differently. Here are other people working on the well-being of the children in our community. Mm -hmm. how, can I, how can I not be of service? Uh, and I think that's just a, you know, and that's a beautiful process to get coalesced. We have leadership and we're, we're adjusting to uh, the, you know, our community. We have rivers and bridges and things to, you know, we have real geographical issues, not just uh, um, political um, and social issues, but that's a community working together to do to right by its children, uh, and I'm, I'm really proud to be a part of that that process. Absolutely. Yeah, and I I just want to say that I think that is an incredible example of uh, that meaning Pittsburgh. What Lewis talked about this morning, mm -hmm. I, I don't think we have, uh, and I was hoping that he would give us more examples, and I think we'll we'll collect them ourselves throughout the course of the conference of networks that are really working towards uh, improvement practice to use his phrase, and I think uh, Pittsburgh and the Kids and Creativity Network has really uh, created an infrastructure to do that across the city, and there just aren't, there aren't a ton of examples of folks doing that, and I think it's really mm -hmm. worth uh, raising that up and paying attention to it, because mm -hmm. I, think, I think it's incredibly important. Absolutely. So to follow along with that, talking about like how, how things get implemented and maybe some of the kids and creativity people can chime in, uh, what are some first steps for connecting? I mean, I think finding people is sometimes hard. Uh, oops, there's a hand in the back. Yeah. Mind crack. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We can talk about it for a little bit. I, mm -hmm. I have a 10 year old and a seven year old who I play Minecraft with. <laughs> yeah. um, and I, so they, they clearly play a lot more than I do. Um, but I play some. And, um, and I've actually found there to be so many different lessons that we actually can take from that world. So I, I host a server at my house. Um, and um, you're a geek. <laughs> I, I had one too. I had one too for a while. Yeah. Yeah. I also have a server. Nerd. 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 No way. I, I, I prefer nerd. Also single. Unrelated though. Um, so I think I think having some so you don't you don't need to spend as much time as they do in there, but having some level of participation and. Um, and, and some sense of what's going on. There's just so many great points to sort of think about. Uh, th there's actually no consequence. There's very little consequences in Minecraft. You know, if someone blows up my part of the world, it's a virtual world that's been blown up. And you can it's, set the clock back. And that, yeah, and so there's, 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 so, there's so little that happens there. But it's such a great opportunity for sort of saying, well, 
you know, who, who did this and, and, and what do you do as, as a result of that? So it's someone else that did something, maybe they did it as an accident, maybe it was retaliation. How do you sort of think about that relationship? It's not, it's not in the heat of the moment then. It's a chance to be reflective on that opportunity and to sort of discuss it with them. Um, there's been a lot of opportunities I've found with my own kids. There's the, the time that they, they ran a, this, this, if you haven't played, so they actually ran a shop that sold Minecraft heads it was called a head shop. <laughs> <laughs> Completely legal. So you call it. Not only in Colorado. <laughs> and um, and someone stole all their heads. <laughs> and it was a business partner of theirs. So so it was a great opportunity to think about. Well, how did you how did you have the relationship with this person? What kind of like the, and and there was so much learning that happened as a result of that. Um, and and I, I spent you know maybe half an hour total playing with him in there. So I knew what the thing was that they were doing. I knew that they had invested a lot into it. I didn't have a chance to stock heads in their store, <laughs> um, but um, but I did know enough about it to have that to that at level intersection. And I think it goes it goes to that. I mean, I feel like um, I was adjacent enough. I had enough of an overlap with them, enough of adjacency to them to understand where they're coming from. And that it it, I, it in my head as a designer, I think it's also important because I'm not. My maturity is slightly more than a ten-year-old at this point, <laughs> um, but I think it's really important to have enough of that to really understand that I'm designing something that that they're going to like and they're going to enjoy, and and being in that same place with them for some time um, is important. The, uh, yeah. the, there are such communities of practice around Minecraft, oh and and you always watch kids who are really fanatic about any kind of video game, but in particular, you know, this conversation Minecraft, and you know, go to YouTube and like just recently there was a great BBC article about um, Stumpy Long Nose and Stumpy Long Head, which is like the name on YouTube for Minecraft content, and like you know, it's a it, all it is is a recording of a 23 year old guy playing Minecraft and speaking out loud as he plays it. And he really appeals to 8 to 12 year olds. And he's got some magic there. And many kids who are Minecraft fans who watch on YouTube, they're all watching Stumpy Long Nose. Yeah. I think what you'll see in there and also uh, is the fact that kids will go on and learn and teach themselves. That in fact, you know, what is it that you can do to create the kind of conditions for that kind of excitement to want to learn something? And then you'll see kids who will become novices, now become experts and teach somebody else. Mm -hmm. And I think that's very powerful. And I think as a parent uh, to get involved in to play, what does it mean to learn? You know, and what does it mean to learn when it's really hard? Because we, we sometimes forget, um, even as a teacher, uh, we, re we have an expert mind, but we forget what the beginner's mind is like. And this is a way to come back to the beginner's mind. I think as a teacher, I've adopted a learner first mentality than teacher. Uh, because sometimes you can have kids emerge as experts in your space on a whole list. I mean, because they don't have jobs, relationships, no mortgages. <laughs> they have like a lot of time to, to have in-depth encyclopedic knowledge. And for those kids that love in Minecraft, I mean, they, you're like, do you sleep? Do you, do you, do you, and it's, you know, and I think that's just, be, it's beautiful, right? That this concept of learning and sharing and that natural uh, kind of gift economy about wanting to spread. And kids who might have been quiet and reserved in an environment, when you create the conditions where they can be brilliant, um, and to share that, I think, is, is, a, is a fantastic thing. I think that's also true for adults, though, too. Like, there are right. so many people that I talk to that don't think that they deserve to be at a table or that they're allowed to have a conversation. Like, my background is not in education. I certainly have imposter syndrome a lot of the time. <laughs> and so giving ourselves permission to let other people be experts without necessarily needing credentials and being, being able to just be at the table and have conversations with each other and offer perspectives without it, you know, they're, amazing ideas come from strange places, so. So I'm going to take the other side. I think Minecraft is boring. <laughs> and I say that as a, and, and this is my world. I'm in DML. I love games. Are you a League I, of Legends person? Or? I have a 12 year old son. My God, I have the hardest time getting into it with him. It's like and it's, it's like Seinfeld. Has, but it's not. It's, a game it's like about nothing. Well, you know. so yes. I say that I say that to say this. Um, I. Uh, one of the things that we learned from our research uh, is that a lot of the ways that kids learn about their interests, and I think this is true for adults, is you sort of spend time hanging out with friends, you spend time with siblings, and as you see what they're doing, you have the opportunity to mess around, to really sort of tinker and to play with something, and then to geek out. 
uh, and get deeper into it. It's that, that is a really hard thing to do as an adult, and particularly as a parent, because your kids are already deeply geeking out, and they're so far off in whatever land, it's really hard to become the novice yeah. and to, to go along with them, but yet you want to be participating, because th there's almost this parent connecting to kid as, as part of the practice. Um, and it's, this tool is not meant to be just parent and kid, but uh, I have found it incredibly helpful. Uh, folks in our community, the Connected Learning Alliance has been developing a tool which right now we're calling Hamago, which is hanging out, messing around, geeking out. And it has, um, one of the things it does is it's a very lightweight tool that allows folks to collaborate with each other. Uh, one of the things that it's been doing over the last year in beta has been having these hangouts and opportunities for parents with their kids to come on in groups of 10 uh, around Minecraft, for example, and to just be having conversations, parents with parents, but also with their kids, which is a very different, it's not the online, it's not the, you know, the, the forum, it's not watching a YouTube, it's not a, it's, it's a much more of a family experience, but with other families around Minecraft, but you're still in your house, and it's just been a really nice lightweight way to become more of a community around a shared practice. I mean, it, Hamago's doing that around a bunch of shared practices and shared interests so that people can find lightweight ways to enter in to communities to pursue your interests. And I think it's an incredibly important tool and a really, it's a nice addition to all the other tools out there about how to, how to join communities, how to explore your interests. And I think uh, kids, uh, it's a little bit easier for them with the online world. I think we as adults, it's a little bit harder to figure out what the on-ramp is into this world, and I, I found this tool to be particularly helpful. Let me say two more things. So one is, um, and I think that, uh, there are a lot of good points there that, that you just made, Connie, but I think... Except that Minecraft is boring. Except that Minecraft is... I didn't say all of your points, but I said a lot. <laughs> one you're just lately wrong on. I, Minecraft is... A, it's a, I, I know, I agree. I just wanted to... You're allowed to have a I was I was separating myself from the kumbaya moment. <laughs> but, um... Uh, most of the stuff that goes on in Minecraft, my kids are way better at than I am, um, and I, don't, I just wind up not doing many of them. Um, but there's one or two that I'm that I'm good at, and so that's where I try to have my intersection around. And that's the way a lot of people try to enter communities. And I imagine that's a lot of the stuff that kind of goes on there is trying to identify those one or two things that you might be able to do that are uh, that are, are valuable, but but um, but are, are are sort of um, deep and narrow. Uh, the, the last thing I'll say is a, is a plug. Uh, there's a, a panel I'm on at PAX East in a month. If you're if those are you around Boston on parenting through games, um, and actually I'm on that one with my son, who will be sort of taking the other side of this. <laughs> oh, so he'll be a child, being a child through games, I guess. <laughs> that's, you know, that's one thing that I like about PAX East, is that kids can go. There aren't many conferences that kids can go to, and that's one that allows it. Yeah. Yeah. So I think, one of, I'm going to redirect the conversation a little bit. Um, so one of the since we've recognized that connecting practices is awesome, but also very hard, and that we don't do it a lot in our work. So what that, that means shifting how we're thinking about or doing our work in some capacity. What are some small things that people can start to do to, when in their, their own professional development, start connecting, reaching out? Uh, what are some steps that you've used to create connections? Anyone? I, I want to pick up on your imposter syndrome. Because <laughs> I, I think um, I think you have to, uh, one of the things you have to learn is to be comfortable with that. Because mm -hmm. <laughs> I think that's the way you have to get out of your comfort space. Um, so I'm, I'm uh, now, now I'm really ashamed to admit this after our conversation about zombies earlier, but I'm a biologist <laughs> by training. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, and 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 I, I you know I, I've been in this field now for a long time, and, and I, I still feel like an imposter sometimes. Um, uh, but that's that's when you sort of step out into those other fields, um, and you do have to sort of get out of your comfort zone and understand that you're that that you're going to bring in, even though there's going to be people who know way more than you do in lots of areas forever. Um, there's going to be something that you bring to that, just like just like you can bring that one thing to Minecraft. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I will. I will. <laughs> Uh, so, uh, so that, that that's that's an important lesson for me is being 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 comfortable, being feeling like you are the imposter, and knowing that knowing that you're not, yeah, at least being able to step back and understand it. Being just a, like being willing to be a bit brave about reaching yeah. out to people too. It's yeah. amazing 
how often people don't think of themselves as experts and so are very willing to, uh, I read your paper, will you talk to me about this? And they're like, yeah, sure. So I think being, being brave about reaching out to people is important. It's funny how, you know, how we started this panel, you know, what are the things that people wouldn't know about us that we do, you know, hobbies or interests or whatnot. And, and I think um, if you follow some of them, I know how I grew some of my other communities outside of what I traditionally do is just by uh, following others on Twitter. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm surprised at how many really great friends I've made through Twitter in like the last five years who, who like toys, who like children's media, who like um, Minecraft or whatever. Um, and, and I haven't found it through LinkedIn and Facebook is not really the place for it. Um, but I'm surprised a lot, just, just a couple of weeks ago I found somebody that loved Twitter analytics research, and that's a kind of a little pet thing of mine too, and we never would have met. And the only difference is like he loves college and I love K-12. So then we had this really, for days we had this Twitter conversation about who's got the better research about schools in the UK or tech products or whatever, and that was just happenstance by searching something that I liked. If you don't follow Scott already, you should. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. I actually found you completely. Scott is uh, actually these three here are all on the board of working examples, and I found Scott just by like researching something to do with com something completely random, and your name came up, and I was like, "This is a really interesting guy," and I just emailed him. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> well, and it, it, people who write research, nobody calls them. <laughs> You can call them. They love it. <laughs> they love to talk about their research. Is that true, Aaron? Yeah. Uh, sometimes. <laughs> I, would, I would concur on the Twitter. That's been my best professional development, and it's the yeah. adjacent uh, you know, innovation. I follow people in science, in design, um, in cognitive behavioral therapy, and, uh, um, economists, um, all yeah. kinds of things, and you're privy to a conversation. That at times yeah. can be overwhelming. It's like uh, the Mississippi coming at you. But you can dip in and just see what people are talking. You get really good examples. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, just to know, there was an article in the New York Times this week. Uh, this one was talking about things that she learned in, in her 40s. And she said, look, there are no adults. We're all just faking it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and so I think if, we, if we're just all on to each other, be like, hey, look, we don't. None of us know what's going on. <laughs> um, I think we can be more open um, and humble and empathetic about uh, collaborating. like human-centered design, mm -hmm. um, the design, just looking at even how they do knowledge and uh, even how they present problems, it's often like a, a, a kind of, you look at your work and there's an open model of having your work critiqued. Mm -hmm. um, you know, imagine if you brought that in the kind of teaching realm, mm -hmm. that you, you were okay to be, you know, one of the things I loved, and also gaming, because I went, uh, Games Learning Society, they have this uh, great part, it's called the Hall of Shame, where you come and present like what failed, it's like the Hall of Failure. And just imagine to, at the university level to be like, we failed, and let me tell you how it happened. Because like, oh, this is a great idea, yeah, no, it doesn't work. Um, and in fact, if, if we presented science, which science is all about failure, I mean, right? I mean, it's like the 1% of which works, but it's really like over 90% of it just is straight failing. Um, so I think um, 
those those two have been very important to me: game design, gamers, and uh, human-centered design. There's actually a really great resource. IDEO has yeah. uh, human-centered design for educators, and they've got a bunch of videos and different uh, toolkits and stuff. So I highly recommend. I'm a big, also a big fan of human-centered design. Yeah. Um, so I highly recommend checking yeah. that. And we have that's Maya Design out. in Pittsburgh, yes. the Luma Institute that teaches like human centered design. So it's mm -hmm. a great resource. I've been working with architects, and again, because both of the design qualities, uh, but also I think an artist. I think folks who understand critique, performance spaces, and how you help scaffold and engage folks through critique and to create artifacts that get ready for performance because I think that's an incredibly important next step in how we think about education. And I'm sitting here as we're thinking about answering this question and I, and I feel like part of me wants to also say we should need to be mindful of what's not an adjacency mm -hmm. in the sense that, and I, and I don't mean to offend anybody in the room, I think education has too long over the last 20 years turned to business and to economists to help us figure out how to be more efficient. And I think that has not been the right adjacency and has caused us more harm um, than helped us in really thinking about how to redesign what a learning experience looks like. I'm going to add medicine to that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I would too, kind of. <laughs> so I think, I think we got to think about it in multiple ways and be very careful. All right. Um, so what, you guys talked about a couple of tools. Are there any other tools that you guys have used or that you know of that people could use to start connecting uh, or finding each other? You talked about Twitter. Are there other ex examples? I like this tool called Murally, M-U-R-A-L period L-Y. Mm -hmm. And I like it because it's a collaborative tool. It's also visual. Um, you can post videos in there. Um, you can text, writing, and and then you can structure things in ways so that people actually see your process, which is very much kind of like what Work Example does. On uh, but this could be done on a little bit on smaller scale. And I really, it's just uh, because sometimes we are confused about like how did someone get there, right? I mean, even if the process failed, like what what went into the whole designing of the learning experience and. Um, I think it's it's a great access point if you're looking at a lot of different people to to uh, create something together, and you know also the structure of something adds meaning to what you're doing, and the absence of of space also has meaning because that's one thing I feel like in this age where there's a lo a lot of uh, things that you could put in there, leaving space for people to bring meaning is also just important. So that I feel like that's a nice visual tool in which to kind of create um, and work together, collaborate, post resources. And then, you know, other people can be invited to see and to participate. How do you spell that again? Murally, M-U-R-A-L period dot L-Y. Okay. Any other tools you guys like? I have a couple. Go for it. Um, so Mozilla has a tool called Thimble which is a tool that enables the co-production and shared uh, co-production of websites, among other things, uh, which is, I really try to uh, be supportive of open source tools, and I think that's a particularly great one. Um, and I, 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 in addition to working examples, I think the more we can make, uh, and this again, I really did truly appreciate uh, Lewis's keynote, I think the more right now in terms of where education and learning is, the more we can make the how and our process transparent and share that, and then over time begin to codify some of the how of what we do, the better, the more we're going I'm, to, I'm just trying to remember his words, improve, the, the more we're going to get towards the improvement of practice that he was talking about. And so the tools that allow us to curate practice, the tools that allow us to really make our practices transparent and to share those with, with both those within our communities and across communities, I think, are the ones that we ought to be paying attention to. I'll, I'll add a, a personal plug. Um, we've been helping to start a new site called Education Express, Education, the letter Express, which is about to launch officially in another couple weeks. Um, and the idea is to try to have a publishing platform for people who are doing uh, work in digital learning um, to get the word out there faster because um, right now if you think about the traditional academic publishing cycle it's really long cycles and um, I really think that we want to really make sure that 
research that's going on in this space is actually mm -hmm. informing practice within this space. Um, and right now there's a pretty big gap there. So the idea is to be able to have a place where people from different communities can come. In fact, specifically looking to look at people who are traditionally coming from education with people who are trying to enter this from the new sort of educational technology, technologist side, who, who not, it's not for lack of trying that they've tried to, under, it's, a, it's a new field, you know, it's a, education is sort of an entrenched field with all sorts of jargon and, 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 uh, and, and values. And so coming in from the outside is, is, uh, is challenging. And so figuring out a way to, again, make this both uh, bi-directional where people from both sides can learn and share and, uh, and move forward both practice and research. Can we have a hashtag or a place where people share the tools they're using to share practices? Um, Somebody has tweeted them. <laughs> <laughs> right. I have retweeted. Yeah, right there, the top. Resources shout out. <laughs> no, not just ours, but what they're using. Oh. Yeah. Yes. Do you oh, guys want to awesome. use the DML yeah. Connect hashtag to keep Any doing tools that? that you could recommend? Yeah. We're crowdsourcing. Yes. Yes. We're crowdsourcing <laughs> the, the collective intelligence yes. of the group. Yeah. Beautiful. I think GitHub we just is DML another Connect? interesting one. Should we just use DML, DML Connect? DML Connect, yeah. To share your tools. Um, GitHub is another interesting one. It's primarily for software development, but it has the capability of versioning things in a way that's very different, and I think it'd be interesting to start exploring how to use that in different spaces. All right, so the, the, if there aren't any other tools, the last question I had for you all is, um, how do you think we need to change the way that we're thinking about connecting in order to make it more of a priority in our work? <laughs> or how have you changed the way that you're thinking about connecting to make it more of a priority in your work? I sometimes think, you know, when everyone around you is thinking the same, no one is really thinking. Um, I know exactly what you mean. Yeah. <laughs> I'll second that. Ditto. <laughs> We're the slow children. <laughs> this is why I picked them. Uh, yeah. There, uh, there's this great quote. Um, there's a, a kind of a, uh, a technology theorist, Pierre Levey. Do you know him? Have you heard of him? Henry Jenkins follows him, so I found out about him through Henry. Uh -huh. And uh, he teaches at the University of Ottawa, and there are many things that he's kind of known for, and he's got a great book about collective intelligence that came out like 20 years ago and predicted, in a sense, the Arab Spring and a whole bunch of other social oh, yes. media events. And he has this uh, uh, quote that he says is that, um, um, I don't, uh, and I'm going to do it, uh, I'm not going to do it justice. This is like, um, no one person knows everything. Everyone knows something. All of knowledge resides in humanity. And one might argue that the more you bring unfamiliar practices together, the more opportunities for learning and knowledge collaboration actually can occur. I'll, I'll answer this a little bit from my, from my perspective in academia, um, most of which is not set up particularly well to value collaboration across in cross-disciplinary ways. Um, but I think that's changing somewhat, and I, I have a somewhat biased view being the only person in education at MIT. Um, so I have to do this. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I, there, you know, MIT is, I, I think, been a, a sort of a leader in sort of thinking about these kind of centers that are specifically designed around a problem. And then the, about the people who you bring in, so we have one on the environment. We don't have an environmental studies department. We have a center, and then there's different people that sort of come in from different departments and get together on this. And I think that's a model that more universities are thinking about. It's not one I've seen a lot in the, in the education learning space very much, um, but I think it could benefit a lot from that happening. Um, I think one thing to, <clears throat> the way I think, of, we need new metaphors for learning. And I think connected learning is along yeah. that way, and, and metaphors that we can um, to think to get us to think more holistically and think about community. You know, if you think about like a debate, debate that that metaphor it has winners and losers. You know, what are the ways in which we can think about learning where we can see people thriving? Uh, that it's a the community and it's tied to its health. So I think um, ways to th what are some new metaphors? We don't have the language, and we um, I think also to teach uh, new ways to see. Because oftentimes, we, even we have these really great learning experiences, what we come back to is like, oh, well, you know, the test scores will go up. And there's a different, what are the, you know, what are the other ways of measuring? What are the other ways of telling the story? And it's really for us to challenge ourselves to think differently about how we tell the story. Um, so 
I don't have answers, I just have questions. Um, I guess I'm working on them, though. <laughs> How do, we, uh, how do we take that back to our institutions, maybe, and have those conversations with uh, our peers and also with the people who might be in leadership, who might, or at least in administration, uh, and actually <laughs> sorry, um, and, and actually talking about uh, connecting, you know, within our institutions and across institutions, that uh, the ways in which we sort of translate that to people who aren't necessarily connected. I think sometimes just doing it and proving it is really important, demonstrating. Um, and so I know for me, I come from kind of a design background, but I am always very intentional about making sure I reach, reach out and then being able to demonstrate that out to people, the value that talking to someone in academia or talking to one of my users has brought to the table. And the more I can communicate that up, um, the more value that it kind of walks people into the idea rather than selling them on, on the big idea and you, you develop some methods for doing that internally. Anyone else? Um, yeah, I think we also, I mean, how many people have uh, ed camps in their cities or unconferences? I think those are the beginnings of having yeah. those in your cities to, to begin to have these informal ways that people, you know, I don't think that people even know that they could question the system, that there, there is a different way out there. Um, I also think uh, that's a soft way. I think it's also to remember to not be aggressive mm -hmm. about some of these things. Because think about you, how you've come to have enlightenment about and understanding about different ways of learning. And we have to be uh, just as empathetic with people who don't know or who are afraid. And uh, can we create multiple access points? And I think um, an ed camp or a, a an unconference is a great way that people can say, oh, actually, I could be a part of a community. We can drive the discussion. The discussion doesn't have to come from the top down. Uh, but different ways of kind of self-organizing. Or what if we, you know, every community had like a failure summit? We got, oh, yeah, that sucked. <laughs> right? What do we learn from that? But, you know, we disarm. We disarm uh, and really look at ways we can learn from each other. Yeah, or we just started a ed tech meetup in Pittsburgh that, with the goal of having that be around professional development so that people that are interested in connecting across practices could uh, do that more intentionally. I think one, one thing to think about, too, is sort of self-reflection and, you know, it's like, shut up. If you're the kind of person who is constantly in the middle of a conversation and is, is constantly, you know, talking, 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 I mean, like, shut up and listen. Like, like spend some time to take it back and you talk about how important it is to reach out. For some people, it's really important to just step back. <laughs> you know, think about, you know, what is your style and what are you doing? Absolutely. You know. Awesome. Well, that, it is 3.31, so... Uh, Time for us to shut up. <laughs> <laughs> thank you all. And thank you guys so much. That was awesome. Thank you. Thank you, thank you for sharing. I always really enjoy what you have to say. Oh, thanks. I, I really enjoyed did. you too. That was good. <laughs> Very well done. <laughs>